Okay. Hello everyone. Um hopefully um you can hear me this time. This is a re-recording of um a presentation that I gave for the stick conference um on the twenty first of October twenty twenty. Unfortunately, I think the first ten minutes of the presentation was um lost due to my terrible internet connection slash um husband's laptop will blame him um, <laughs> so today uh won't be exactly the same unfortunately because i tend to do it on a bit of a wing and a prayer um but i'll go through these presentation slides again um and bring you through the uh, bring you through the presentation again okay so just very quickly this is my social media presence so if you want to get involved with my blog or follow me on Instagram or Twitter and use the hashtag Railway Architecture and go for it. That's That'd be very much appreciated. So today we're going to very quickly give you um, a history of the Great Northern Railway in Ireland, just to bring everybody up to speed. Um, we're going to talk about William Hemingway Mills. Um, this is his signature um, on one of his drawings here. He was the first engineer in chief for the Great Northern Railway and um, it's really his earlier influences um, that uh, had, had the biggest influence on the GNR and its draftsmanship um, and subsequently architecture as well. Um, a brief history about stylistics um, and just really starting to think about how um, historical um, figures in draftsmanship, in architecture and in engineering really have had an impact on um, the draftsmanship of engineers even up to the present day. Then we're going to look specifically at just some of the GNR drawings and um, really get up close and personal with them. Um, this is recorded so I'm afraid there's no questions but we did have um, a few questions at the end as well but um, if you do have any questions in particular um, you can always contact me on Twitter as well, and I can um, I can respond on there. Okay, so the Great Northern Railway was established in 1876. It was an amalgamation of three earlier railway companies, as you can see here, and the Northern Railway of Ireland itself was an amalgamation of two earlier railway companies. So, when the GNR was founded, it inherited this myriad of infrastructure, which included architecture. And as you can imagine, it was already kind of falling out of favour and becoming very outdated. Um, so William Hemingway Mills really had the task of updating an inherited railway infrastructure rather than building a whole new one. Um, new branch lines were built, but they tended to be very short. Um, but the main infrastructure, the main network was already in place. Um, because of this, uh, Mills really went to town if you like he took it very seriously and he created um, a branding using architecture and using polychromatic brickwork so my phd really is about the architecture of the great northern railway but in order to understand the architecture you need to understand how it was designed and that's where draftsmanship comes in um, so the network was originally over 560 miles of track i've had to visit over 140 railway stations um, and there are existing today over 360 drawings. These are in the Irish Railway Record Society archives, which are located behind Houston Station in Dublin. Uh, for this research, I've digitised them and catalogued them all for the first time. Um, so hopefully um, I'll be able to donate these back to the society and then it will become a resource for other people to use as well. And this is the original railway network from 1906 covering all of Ireland. I mean, you can really appreciate that the entire island of Ireland was completely connected by railways. Um, the Great Northern Railway Line, just to give you an idea, my pointer should be here. Hopefully you should be able to see that. Um, actually, do we have the little um, thing down here? This might be a useful laser pointer. There we are. Excuse me. Here we go. Uh, so this is Dublin down here. Uh, Belfast is up here. So the, this is the only line now. From the Great Northern Railway that's still left um, and then we have it stretching out here from Drogheda up to Enniskillen and then it heads all the way up to Derry up here and if you imagine there are all these different cross lines here as well imagine it as a hand stretching out from Dublin all the way up to the north and the northwest 
and to give you a contrast, this is the Irish Railway network as it stands today. Um, obviously, I'm looking at the north of Ireland, um, and I do try and be a little bit apolitical, but I think we can all agree that the border has had a very detrimental um, impact uh, on the railway network of Ireland. So William Hemingway Mills, I'll just pop that down there. The man of the hour. Um, he was born in Yorkshire in 1835 and he was trained at the Midland Railway. This is Derby. Derby is where Midland Railway had its central engineering work. So this is where he would have um, spent his um, formative years training under the Midland Railway's chief engineer, William Henry Barlow. And we'll look at one of Barlow's um, drawings uh, just in a moment. Mills was then um, employed in Scotland and also for the Andalusian Railway. So uh, one thing I want you to just pay attention to here, the occupiment window, which is this gable end here, um, and also to the semi-architrave moulded window openings here, and also things like these uh, Romanesque entrance archways. Um, Mills was also a, an engineer on the Mexican Railway. This is Pueblo Railway Station. Again, the occupant pediment window is uh, is evident here, as are the Romanesque um, arches and the columns um, creating the, the front arcade entrance to the building. Um, Mills obviously was responsible for creating a branding for a new company, and the architecture really bears these hallmarks, these key architectural features, um, from his earlier career. So he is open to interpretation, he is open to influence, um, and he really does pick and choose these key architectural features and, and, and training um, in order to then um, use them to full fruition at the GNR. So this is a drawing by William Henry Barlow. His signature is just down here, as you can see. Uh, this is actually for the foundation of St Pancras Railway Station. And in terms of the style of draftsmanship, it's very, very technical. Barlow was a mathematics professor at the Royal College in Woolwich, uh, which is a military, obviously, background. Military draftsmanship really spearheaded engineering draftsmanship. Um, and as I mean, this aesthetically isn't necessarily designed to please the eye. Um, it's very instructive. It's very technical. In order to interpret it and to understand it, um, you would really have to have a very high level of understanding of engineering draftsmanship um, and construction. Um, it's very busy. There are overlapping um, elements here as well to give the sense of basement um, and ground levels and also the sense of the foundation tunnels as well. Um, to give a bit of um, context, these um, square columns up here are actually now where the entrance to the Eurostar is. Um, so anyone who's been to St Pancras will um, appreciate the uh, uh, the layout of uh, of this drawing. So I mentioned that Mills uh, was employed in Scotland. So he was an apprentice to James Samuel, um, and he actually met one of his um, draftsmen, a, a, a man called Charles Robbins, who would subsequently be Mills's chief engineer, uh, engineering assistant at the GNR. Um, and him, him and Robbins worked together under Samuel. And this drawing by Samuel, or to his workshop, um, is really is the epitome of the height of mechanical engineering draftsmanship. It uses the style of draftsmanship called descriptive geometry, which was um, developed by the French engineer Gaspard Monge and it's really to do with creating these three-dimensional forms on the page and bringing conical shapes and you know cylindrical shapes to life on the page. This is all using um, different um, uh, weights of ink linear ink drawing. So if you just have a look at some of these elements up here, the difference between light and shade and, and this um, uh, bouncing off conical figures really is, uh, is presented wonderfully in this um, element down here. It's all just created using lines, uh, which when you think about it that way, it's uh, actually quite dramatic. So we have these two um, types of draftsmanship that Mills is exposed to early on in his career. We have the very, very flat and technical mathematical um, style of draftsmanship. And then we have this very highly detailed 
um, kind of morphology um, of 3D forms on the page created through descriptive geometry. So if we go back into history, this Palladio is drawing of Villa Rotonda. Um, it's artistic even in its very presentation, you know, it's a scroll that's been beautifully, you know, pinned up onto the wall. But if we look first actually at the bottom half of this drawing, we have the front elevation of the building, which is purely architectural and artistic artistic in its presentation. You've got these sculptural forms um, uh, presented as well as um, the, the shading of the dome um, and also the, the frontispiece, the main entrance, um, this kind of neoclassical uh, columned portico entrance. Um, one thing that is interesting, and this is where Palladio started to bring engineering into architecture, is this cross section that cuts through one half of the building. And it's utterly um, uh, functional um, in that it shows you how this building is actually constructed and how it stands up. We have these supporting foundation arches here and we also have the structure, you know, the, the supporting gables and the roof. This is actually how this building is designed to, to stand up. And so we have this juxtaposition at the bottom with the architectural draftsmanship and then on the top we have the engineering draftsmanship. And it's important to note, um, I mean this is in the 1700s, um, right up until really in the 19th, end of the 19th century, engineering and architecture as as um, as careers, they weren't separated as these uh, Catholic subjects and one didn't speak to the other. The engineer and the architect, by and large, were actually trained together in the same classroom. And indeed, they were the same person, um, depending on whether somebody was designing a railway or somebody was designing a church, which did happen and happened in Ireland quite frequently as well. They could either be described as an engineer or an architect. So these um, definitions of career paths were um, were actually interchangeable. And now we move to Gas. Uh, sorry, this is um, Jean Nicolas Durand. Um, he was a student of Gaspard Monge, so he actually trained with uh, descriptive geometry. But compared to Samuel's use of this mechanical form, you can see this is much flatter. The interesting thing that Durand brought to, and he was engineering um, education, he was um, a lecturer at the Ecole Polytechnique. He um, designed this sense of elevations, plans and sections presented on a page as these separate elements. And this is where this clear sense of communication um, of architectural um, engineering comes to play, where it's, it's not just about the stylistics of the buildings and its finished form, it's actually about how this building can, um, can actually be built. And French um, textbooks were... Uh, prolific in reading lists for um, British uh, engineering um, courses, for example, at King's College uh, and also in Ireland as well. The University of Cork and Galway and Trinity College in Dublin all had engineering departments and the draftsmen that were employed um, at the GNR all had um, university education. So they would have been exposed to these French uh, forms of draftsmanship. And it's often uh, kind of the, the standardised trope is that uh, British engineering education, you know, only really focused in on uh, the apprenticeship system and this idea of a formal education, as was uh, preferred in France, uh, really kind of, you know, just, just didn't happen in the British education system. And that's not actually true. We can see that through the GNR and its own draftsmen. I think by and large, probably for... Um, this kind of, for want of being a bit snobby, lower level of engineering where, you know, you had men employed in workshops constantly producing random pieces of machinery to go into locomotives and, and shipbuilding and things like that. Um, absolutely, you know, that you had to learn on the job, if you like. Um, but when it comes to architecture, you, you're, you're coming to this uh, level of needing to understand European uh, stylistics and forms, for example, Gothic, Romanesque, different things like that. You, you have to understand um, kind of the, the theory of architecture before you can actually start to practice it. And it's very interesting that you have engineers who are actually learning about architecture at the same time as being trained as an engineer. 
so as I said, my focus is on, oh, sorry, I'll just get rid of that. My focus is on um, the architecture itself. But in order to understand the architecture, I really have to, sorry, go back to the drawing board um, and understand how the buildings were created, how they were designed, who created these drawings, um, and where did this standardised format of the GNR drawings come from? As we'll see um, just going forward now, um, there is a very formulaic um, stylistic to all of the, the GNR drawings. And as we've seen um, from Durand and Palladio moving through to the engineering draftsmanship, um, these drawings all follow a very similar pattern. Um, and this pattern really comes from the standardization of education. That education comes from France. So it's very, very important to link those two together and not see France uh, and Britain as these, um, as, you know, as these, these separate um, engineering education um, and, and styles of, of, of training. So this standardization comes through in education, but also in the tools and the methods that are used, um, not only to produce the drawings, but also the things that they're able to communicate as well. So I'm just going to read you this um, uh, quote, which is from Armin Gord. It's actually um, the Practical Draftsman's um, Handbook of Industrial Design. It was on literally all of the reading lists of these universities that I mentioned before. Um, so industrial design is destined to become a universal language. It is indeed the medium between thought and execution. By it alone can the genius of conception convey its meaning to the skill which executes or suggestive ideas become living practical realities. So this sense of a universal language is required across not only the engineering and architectural um, industry, but also going into the craftsmanship industry, the builders, the makers, the contractors. The man on the ground has to be able to pick up a design drawing and interpret it and understand it and therefore be able to create it because it's all very well creating a wonderful uh, drawing of a magnificent building but if the thing can't actually be constructed and the man who's building it cannot understand what you're trying to communicate then it's utterly meaningless and so we have these standardized tools and methods um, that start to be developed and this was one page um, from the uh, from the draftsman's handbook and you can see just if you look at the two top uh, forms here very simply just by using shade and linear form the conical shape that's presented is able to either be convex or concave on the page. The three-dimensional form is purely created through linear ink lines and shading. Another important um, aspect of engineering draftsmanship, something that's often overlooked, um, is font. Um, and some of these are the most common font that actually appears in the GNR. Um, we have the tables, uh, the titles, um, and the um, uh, use of measurements and things like that that are given. I quite like this middle one at the bottom, um, which is designed to look like handwriting. So for the written specifications, although it's actually um, written by hand, it's actually copper plate handwriting. So it's the precursor of the, the, the typed CAD uh, drawing, if you like. So now we move on to the GNR drawings themselves. Uh, this is for um, an iron roof at Amiens Street Station. This is now Connolly Station in, in Dublin. And, you know, at the very beginning, we can see this is very clearly an engineering drawing. Um, it's quite flat, you could argue. Uh, we've got the font, which is very um, um, formulaic. Uh, the layout has this Durandian um, stylistic of the plan, the elevations, the sections and the details. But if we just zoom in, we can start to see the sheer amount of um, artistry that's gone into creating these uh, molded iron forms and the communication of um, the 3D form of this column is, I'll just bring that one up as well, the sheer amount of energy and effort and skill that has gone into creating these aspects of light and shade and ink 
lines to create these outlines of this shape. The shape in itself is actually aesthetic in terms of architectural style and form, but also its presentation on the page. Um, this is actually created by using an airbrush technique, so actually literally blowing through ink through a straw, which as you can imagine isn't uh, easy to manipulate on the page. So this highly highly skilled aspect of engineering draftsmanship and would create would actually involve an awful lot of artistic um, merit as well. I'll just go back. So if you stand sort of from a distance, it almost becomes hidden on the page. But once you start to really look at this form, if you were the builder who had to construct this, immediately you understand what is being com communicated to you on the page. This is Brookmount Station. Um, so as you can see here, we've got these semi-architrave window frames that we used to see at the um, Spanish and the Mexican railway stations. And I'm just going to zoom in on this elevation here. And I'm going to draw your attention specifically here to the colours that have been used. So the colour coding is standardised across the industry. So this universal language now really is starting to come into the fore. Bricks are always um, in this kind of reddish um, orange shade. Brick bonding is always um, denoted by uh, these ink linear forms. Um, the lead is um, given here just above this gable door and also uh, uh, above the chimney as well. Um, and we have the black and yellow brickwork that's also presented here. Now, as I said, the GNR is famous for its polychromatic brickwork, so that's primarily what I'm interested in. But for the draftsman, the watercolours that have been used just to create the this ground work here, I mean the artistry that's involved there, it's it looks freehand, arguably it is, but it's trained. It's standardised. Every single time the ground is created, it's created in this manner. So you could argue in one way that it's artistic, but actually in another way it's very formulaic. Um, one other thing as well here is that you've got the depth perception created here through using shadow. These gentle washes that would have been applied after this entire drawing would have been finished just really give you the sense of um, depth perception and three-dimensional form. And again, it's about understanding um, the angles and the projections of the architecture so that the builder could understand the angles for which, for example, he's actually having to cut the, these, these pieces of wood. An important thing to, to note here as well is standardised um, light and shade is that the sun is the, always the uh, the light source and it always comes from the top left hand corner so that it's always projecting down to the bottom right hand side and in that vein you have this universal language of the shading is always created from a 45 degree angle from the left hand side and therefore the depth percep perception is measured accordingly. This is for Dunmurray um, Station in 1883, is it 1885? Um, and this is very, very dramatic. Again, we have this colour coding. Pink here isn't used because the brickwork was pink. It's actually the colour for concrete. So that's worth keeping in mind as well, is that um, when anything is actually being built and pink is used, it's not because they had pink flooring or anything like that, which would have been a bit wacky. Um, it's actually the, the, the colour coding for, for concrete. Again, this artistic uh, kind of use of uh, freehand to denote the uh, uh, grains of wood. And if we zoom in here, the level of skill that is required to do this uh, amount of shading on these gate on this gable end is absolutely stunning and it really the the dramaticism of it um really gives you a sense of how far out um this gable end is 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 projecting um and it's not just this kind of dramatic use here if we come down here to these molded pieces of brick just this very very slightness of hand that is just bringing that shading up there and also down here as well and it gets narrower as it goes along all the way around and you can imagine the, the level of control that is required not only in your hand but also understanding the amount of paint that you have on your brush um, and again the builder the contractor can look at this drawing and immediately understand this top part 
uh, of the rounded arches projects further out from the red brick main body behind it and again it recesses back into these yellow bricks which create the uh, the arches for the windows and all of that is communicated by this tiny little line here and this tiny little line here so we're going to zoom in again now this is actually the same drawing but it's gone a bit pixelated unfortunately but again shading is of the utmost most importance and i just wanted to draw your attention to this area here where you have the carved trefoil um, from the sliding door, the entrance to the sliding door, and how the shading has actually included those cutouts on the projection. It is so minutely detailed that that's the degree um, where the sun is coming from. And instead of just saying, oh, he gets the general idea, you know, that's cut out and that bit will be in shade, he felt it's incredibly important that this technical area here where the dots are needs to be presented accurately on the page in order to be communicated effectively. So this is for Dungannon. Um, this is by Charles Robbins, who I mentioned. Um, you can see his signature just down here to the left hand side. Um, this is for Charles Robbins, uh, who I said trained at um, uh, King's College uh, University and uh, he trained with Mills um, with James Samuel as well and I, you could argue this is actually a very flat and very boring um, drawing it's got you know all the plain elements of the elevation plan the details sections and things like that but actually when we look at one of these um, elevations in detail every single one of those dagger boards is absolutely the same and all of that is done singularly by hand Robbins has also um, done this uh, wonderful light it's not as dramatic say as the later drawings but this wonderful lightness of touch in applying the shading to um, communicate the uh, the projecting awning over the building another thing um, is that we are stood and this is our central point so now we start getting into descriptive geometry if we look over to the right hand side um, uh, this supporting arch here is projecting out to the right and if we come over to the left it's projecting out to the left so Robbins has actually you know unflattened this form by using the mind's eye if we were to actually physically stand in front of this structure these two supporting arches would expand out either side but what we have to remember is that this building didn't actually exist. All of that is this is designed, it's imagined, it's in the engineer's mind. So the ability to actually create a three dimensional freestanding form as it would appear in real life really is where the technicality comes in. And all of that is just communicated by these very, very simple um, arches just at the side of the drawing there. And this is Lawrence Town. Again, now you're getting a real sense of the standardisation of not only architectural design, but the design of draftsmanship and the standardisation of this universal language used by engineers and architects, which is then communicated to contractors and builders. And again, it's not quite as dramatic as some of the earlier drawings, but just this lightness of touch that is used in the moulded brickwork. You know, you can see that again, this part of the moulded brickwork projects slightly forward from the red brick main, which is here. Again, it concaves in on itself around here. And then again, this part of the archway is recessed. And again, this window again is recessed. All of that is created by these very, very delicately and lightly applied um, washes of shading. So I'm just going to end it here now. Um, this is um, a design for an entry gateway um, designed by the architect Samuel Symes for Salt Hill Station. He was actually more known, um, better known for designing churches. And he does use the plan here, as we can see, this sense of the, you know, the Durand uh, style of draftsmanship is coming through. But there's absolutely no other information on there. It's drawn. Um, not from a, uh, it's not coloured in a material, materialistic way. It's uh, it's coloured uh, in a realistic way, um, 
and I'm just going to contrast it now with this design for a gate um, which was designed by a draftsman at the GNR for a, um, a gateway in Kells. The shading on every single rivet and every single joist um, really helps to um, elevate this um, um, quite, sim quite simplistic form from the page um, and all the measurements are given, the colours are given in um, in, in its standardised material form. The gate itself would not have been blue, chances are it would have been green um, because that's the, the paint that was used um, to provide the, the final coat. But this light blue is the standardised um, colour that is used for cast iron. So I'm going to end with this quote from Henry Palmer in his opening address for the Institute of Civil Engineers in 1818. An engineer is a mediator between the philosopher and the working mechanic and, like an interpreter between two foreigners, must understand the language of both. So it's this understanding of an evolved language between the architect, the engineer and the builder, which is required and that is communicated correctly through architectural and engineering draftsmanship. Compared with Symes, what we have is the architect showing us what he wants you to build, and here we have the engineer telling us how you build it. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Again, that's my blog, and you have my um, Irish Whale Arc, which is there. So if you'd like to follow me or get in touch with me on Twitter, please do. And by all means, use that hashtag um, uh, to get in touch as well. So thank you very much.